So folks, this is a load shedding episode. So now we're talking about learn learning unit five, which is companies. First thing we've got to talk about is the fact that a company is a separate juristic and legal person. What does that mean? Now, there's five things that we've got to talk about. The first thing is that there is a separation of ownership and control. In ACC, remember learning unit four was CCs, there was no separation of ownership and control. In a company, there is. The company, it is managed by directors who are appointed by the shareholders. Number two is that there is separate legal personality. So the company's got its own rights, it's got its own obligations. A company can owe money to somebody, but that does not mean that the shareholders owe money to that person. Um, with this in mind, you've got to remember that there's a difference between incorporation which is when you are filing your MRI, you're filing your notice of incorporation and you're giving in your brown envelope, your prescribed filing fee, which is done, all of this is done by the directors and, and registration, which is done by the companies and intellectual property commission. Because there is a bit of time in between incorporation and registration where the company exists, but does not have legal personality. So the first thing is that the separation of ownership and control, separate legal personality. Number three is there is limited liability of the shareholders. Remember in a partnership, we fund them for everything we can get. In a company, we only fund them for um, the company's assets. Personal assets are not exposed, meaning you cannot come after the shareholder's house in his personal capacity. However, circumstances do alter cases. In a personal liability company, in an inc, you can. Not in a public company, not in a private company, unless there's been a whole thing with corporate veil. Number four, assets belong exclusively to the company, not to the shareholders. So just because the company owns a warehouse doesn't mean that the shareholders now suddenly own the warehouse in, the, in their personal capacity. Number five, where there has been a wrong committed against the company, it does not necessarily mean that there has been a wrong committed against the shareholders. So the company must sue. The shareholders can't sue on behalf of the company. So separation of ownership and control, separate legal personality, limited liability of the shareholders, assets belong exclusively to the company, not to the shareholders. And the company has got to um, sue. If a wrong is committed against a company, um, they have got to sue. So now, one of the questions you could get asked is describe the Companies Act in relation to common law. Whenever they say that in relation thing, what they mean is describe it, describe what the one does to the other and vice versa. So when the Companies Act does not mention a particular issue, it might not mention what to do about a company that sells purple peacocks. Common law will apply in that situation. Um, Re common law will apply in all cases if it exists um, unless it is changed by the Companies Act. Um, but it, only common law will apply when the act is silent. So, yeah, so... I'm not explaining it well, but... It, so, for example, if... Uh, let's think of an example. The whole thing of corporate veil. The Companies Act now says that there, we can lift the corporate veil. Remember, we talked about that in our the last time we did this. But back in the day, 
the only way you could lift the corporate veil was under common law. You had to go to court to lift the to lift the corporate veil. So if the companies act did not say now that we can lift the corporate veil, we would rely on the fact that the common law says we can lift the corporate veil. And although the fact that the Companies Act says that we can lift corporate veil, we can include in that the fact that the common law also says it. So either use one or use them both together. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, then we have to um, we have to talk about it in a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about piercing the corporate veil. So yes, um, the Oaks have limited liability, the shareholders. You can't come after them in their personal capacities. Not in all cases does that apply. If they are abusing the enterprise structure that is a company, then you can fung them. You cannot use any entity to justify a wrong, to... Uh, commit a crime, commit fraud. Um, so there's two ways, as we've said, to lift the corporate veil. N number one is under common law. There are three ways, there are three reasons rather, why the common law would say, okay, we've got to lift the corporate veil. Number one is when the company is being used as a front for crime or fraud. Number two, is when a director or shareholder is treating the company's property as their own personal property. First one is when it's being used for fraud or crime. Second one is when the director or shareholder is treating the company's assets as their own. And the third one is when the, um, when uh, positive law, so an act of parliament, uh, says to the courts, okay, you can ignore the company's personality for this and this and this reason. So number one, when it's being used for crime or fraud. Number two, when the directors or shareholders are treating the company's assets as their own. Number three is when the courts can ignore legal personality. So that's the first way to do things. Second way to do things is through section 20. Nine. So section 20, subsection 9 of the Companies Act. Now, what does that say? It, it has extended the definition, the common law definition, and it has extended the common law position making it easier for courts to lift the corporate veil. So they took the three things that the court said, fraud, the thing about assets, and the thing with the courts being allowed to do it if they feel it's right. And they said, okay, fine. We um, are going to give you more power. So section 20, subsection 9, says that if a court has found that the, incorpor that the incorporation of the company the use of the company or an act that the company has done is an abuse of the juristic personality of the company. The, so basically, if the company's juristic personality is being abused, the court can ignore that juristic personality. And the reason that that is lifting the corporate veil is if we ignore the juristic personality of the company, the only thing that is protecting the shareholders and the directors is the fact that the company has separate juristic personality. If we ignore that, now we're funging directors. Now we're funging shareholders. So, yeah. Um, the common law is three things. And the first is if it's being used for fraud or crime. Second is if it's uh, if the directors or shareholders using the company assets as their own. Number three is um, if the court sees fit to do so. And then section 20, subsection 9 takes that further, saying if we... Um, 
If there is the feeling that the juristic personality is being abused, fang them. Common law used to only be able to go after directors um, under section 20, subsection 9. You can go after everybody. Employees, uh, uh, shareholders, directors, everybody. Go after them. Um, the other thing that section 20, subsection 9 allows for is that um, you can now hold the director personally liable for what they've done. Damages, costs, the works. Um, if they have contravened the act, it, you, you used to be able to, as I said, under common law, but it used to be much harder to do so. Now it's much easier because it is specifically written in an act of parliament. And remember what we said earlier, and I know I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but it's a very important point. If the act says nothing, common law applies. If the act says something, we still use the common law to sort of flesh it out a little bit. In this case, we took of lifting the corporate veil, we took what the common law said and we wrote it into law. Meaning that it is now in a much stronger position. Um, also, as we said, section 218, subsection two. But most importantly, remember section 20, subsection nine. So section 20 and then in brackets nine. Anybody, we fung anybody who has committed wrongdoing. Common law was just directors. Now we're not only funging directors, we're funging everybody under the, under the act. Um, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Now let's talk about the ultra virus doctrine. Um, in the old days, so ultra virus means beyond the powers. In the old days, if a company or the directors of a company acted out of what acted against what it said in the MOI. So if the if the uh, company's MOI said it is a um, baking company, it's a bakery, and then they went and ordered um, a thousand hammocks for no reason, for nothing that that had anything to do with any business set out in their MOI. That contract was would not would not be valid. So they can take the stuff, and they can use the stuff, but the people who sold them the hammocks would not be able to enforce the contract against them because they do not have the power to make that contract because the MOI did not allow for it. So anything that was outside the scope of the MOI was seen as ultra virus and not enforceable. Um, the idea behind the ultra virus doctrine was that um, the shareholders would know that the, the their money was being used for the business's purposes and not for anything else. Um, but what was then discovered was that it became a big problem because third parties were contracting with a company and then the company would just say, whoops, sorry, uh, that was ultra virus of us. We apologize. You can't, you can't um, enforce the contract against us. Um, yeah, so that is the ultra virus doctrine. Now, let's talk about the Tarquin rule. Oh, one important thing about um, the ultra virus doctrine is that it still exists. It's all been, it's basically been abolished by statute, but the bits that have been um, kept is that if a director acts ultra virus and damages the company's reputation, they can still be fined for that. That's the bit that's been kept. The bit about the third parties is basically gone. Um, now, Let's talk about the doctrine of constructive notice, which is also basically gone. 
So the doctrine of constructive notice said that third parties who were dealing with the company are deemed to have had knowledge of what was in the MOI. They are, it was assumed that, okay, we are doing business with this company. We, we've read their MOI. Regardless of the fact that they actually had or not. Um, so it was deemed that they knew that the company was acting ultra virus. Although many times it wasn't. Um, so how do we get, how do we deal with the doctrine of construct, constructive notice? Uh, we have the Tarquin rule. The Tarquin rule said that if the third party acted bona fide, if they were in good faith, if they weren't trying to be scallum, if they genuinely thought that the company was doing what it was supposed to in line with its internal procedures and doing what it was supposed to um, in terms of its MOI, then the contract is enforceable. So for example, let's use two examples. So ultra-virus would be um, if the company had, uh, if it was a baking company who bought the hammocks. The Tarquin rule would allow the hammock company to um, get the money back or to enforce the contract because they could say, look, we thought, we genuinely thought that that was in their scope of business operations. Or let's say, for example, in order to, um, what's the word, in order to have a in order to execute a contract, it had to be agreed to by the middle managers, then the senior managers, then, then the directors. But let's say only the directors agreed to it. They didn't ask the other two levels of management. Then the third party could say, oh, well, we had reason to assume that you followed your procedures. We believed with good faith that you followed your procedures. The fact that you didn't follow your procedures has got fuck all to do with us. Um, yeah, so that is the Tarquin rule. So it's the uh, it allows bona fide third parties to believe that the that to, or to claim that the company followed the procedures in its MOI and its internal procedures, and so it allows them to enforce the contracts. So, ultra virus beyond the powers used to allow a company it used to stop contracts that were not in line with the MOI from being enforceable. It was originally to protect the shareholders. It used nine times out of 10, all it did was screw over third parties who were acting in good faith. The reason it existed as well was because they had something called the doctrine of construct constructive notice where the um, third parties that were dealing with the company, they thought, Aish, they've probably read their MOI, even if they hadn't. So the Tarquin rule comes in to prevent that. Tarquin rule says, okay, bona fide third parties can assume that the company acted in good faith, that they, that they were not ultra virus, that they were in line with the, their, their procedures. Um, so then we can enforce the contract against them. Now, section 21 makes the ultra virus doctrine inapplicable between a company and a third party. Remember I said earlier that it, some of it is still in place, that is if a director acts ultra virus. Um, however, it's no longer applicable between the company and the third party. Um, yeah, so also section 19, constructive notice is gone. Tarquin rule is still there only for third parties. So third parties can still claim that we believe that the internal procedures were followed. We believe that they were, that they acted in the way that they should have. Um, but there is an exception to this rule. Um, the exception is section 19.5. If the company is ring fenced and it is clear in the MRI that it is ring fenced RF that there are restrictive provisions then that Tarquin rule does not apply 
because then they should know that there are those restricted provisions. So constructive notice is gone. Ultra virus for third parties is gone. Uh, Tarquin rule applies still. Only exception, if it's ring fenced, then they like, ish, 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 ish. Uh, we did not know that. We should have followed that it was ring fenced. Then they can't enforce it. I hope that makes sense. Um, okay. So let's talk about incorporation and registration. So the 2008 Act, the, the whole idea is that the, it is as easy as possible to incorporate a company, to register a company, and to deal with the whole host of business structures that there are. Um, basically, what you've got to do is you've got to file a notice of incorporation. You've got to pay your prescribed fee, which is your brown envelope. You've got to uh, give a copy of your MOI. Now, that is under Section 13. Once that is done, then they get a registration number. And th th all the incorporation stuff, as I've said, is done by the directors. Now, the, the registration is done by the Companies Intellectual Properties Commission, that's section 14. So what has to go into the memorandum of incorporation? And let's first talk about what the hell is a memorandum of incorporation. So an MOI is a document that sets out the rights, the duties, the responsibilities of the shareholders, the directors and the employees in relation to the company. So it basically sets up the company, says who's involved, what the hell they've got to do, what their rights are. That's it. Um, there are three provisions that go into an MRI. There, the first one is unalterable provisions. Those are provisions that an MOI cannot change. So those are usually provided for by legislation. And that's stuff that, um, that could be stuff that is in the Companies Act that's saying, okay, this company that works in, for example, the logistics industry has to comply with this particular standard. That standard could be a higher standard than other companies. So they can't get rid of that provision if they are a company that works in the logistics industry, for example. The first is unalterable provisions. That's what the company can't change. Or the, the MRI can't change, rather. The um, second is alter, alterable provisions, stuff that they can change. The third thing is default provisions. It's stuff that is going to apply unless it is specifically changed by the MOI. Um, so most of the unalterable provisions will be special provisions that apply particularly to that company. Um, and let's see what else we've got here. Um, so stuff that can be in the MRI includes rights of the shareholders, rights and responsibilities of the directors, what to do when the assets of the uh, what to do with the assets when the company is dissolved? Uh, what are the uh, powers of the auditors, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Anything to do with the company? The the MRI is basically the company's gu uh, guidebook and bible. Anything and everything to do with the company is in the MRI. So remember, unalterable provisions you can't change. Alterable provisions you can. When I say you can't change, it's stuff that's set out in the Companies Act that the company has got to follow. Default provisions, stuff that is going to apply to the company unless the MRI specifically changes it. The, anybody who is involved with the company, the MRI applies to them. So shareholders, it applies to them. Each director, it applies to them. Employees, it can apply to them as well. Um, basically anybody. The only exception is third parties. 
Okay, now let's, we talked about ring fenced companies earlier, but let's do it a little bit more in detail. If you see a company that's got RF at the end of it, run a bloody mile, they have got restrictive conditions. They are ring fenced. They are not allowed to, they are either restricted in how they um, amend their MRI, or they might not be able to um, amend their MRI at all. So the RF allows outsiders, third parties, to see the fact that they have special provisions in their MRI. So be careful when dealing with them. It's like, it's like a warning sign. So they can't just go, it's basically a sign, we've got something weird going on, check the MRI. So they can't suddenly go and say, oh, we didn't know. They can't claim the Tarquin rule if it's a ring-fenced company. Um, because then they should have known. So in normal circumstances, how do we alter the MRI? There's two ways to do it. The first way is through court order. That is usually not the best way to do it. That's usually if there's problems with um, an agreement or if one particular shareholder or director wants to do it and cannot get consent. The second way is through special resolution, which needs to be done by the shareholders. And that is when you would need a, um, you would need the consent of, of the majority of the shareholders. So the two ways are through court order and special resolution. That's how you um, amend your MRI. So now let's talk about the last thing for the learning unit is pre-incorporation contracts. So a pre-incorporation contract is a contract that is entered to but entered into by a person who is acting as an agent, so acting on behalf of a company that does not exist yet. And the reason we have them is so that you don't, we don't miss those lack of deals. We don't miss those business opportunities just because the company doesn't exist yet. Um, so the person who enters into the agreement is basically promising that I'm doing it on behalf of the company. When the company comes into existence, um, they are going to fulfill the terms of the contract. So let's say, for example, I, on behalf of BSC, which doesn't exist yet, uh, buy a building for a million rand. And the promise is that um, when BSC comes into existence, they're going to take ownership of the building. They are going to pay the million rand. Great, fantastic. However, there's an exception. I, in my personal capacity, am jointly and severably liable for whatever I've signed if BSC never becomes a thing. And, or if BSC does become a thing and they reject what I have said or reject what I have signed. So I can sign it on BSC's behalf, but if they never come into existence and they and or they reject any part of what I've done, then I am liable for it. Um, however, if they come in, if the company comes in once they have um, been registered and had all the paperwork done by the CIPC, and they ratify that agreement that I've made. They say, okay, shop, shop, we like it, we're going to ratify it. Um, we will accept the, the agreement, we are going to live up to the terms, so we as BSC will now pay the million rand that he uh, signed on our behalf for. However, they've got three months to do this from the date that they are um, incorporated. Remember, it's not pre-registration agreement, it's pre-incorporation agreement. So BSC has three months from the date it is incorporated to either ratify, amend, or reject what I've done. If they do not do that within three months, then they will be deemed as having agreed to it. So a, say something or you're going to be held liable. You can't just say nothing. You can't just ignore the agreement that I've made and think, oh, that doesn't mean we're liable. 
it does mean you're liable. You have to expressly say, we don't like it. We reject it in order not to be held liable. So pre-incorporation agreement, so business opportunities are not missed. I can sign on BSC's behalf, on the company's behalf. However, if they reject it, um, any part of it, then I'm jointly and severably liable. Why am I jointly and severably liable? To protect the interests of third parties who could get screwed over. When the company comes in and they ratify it, sorted. Fabulous. If they just choose to ignore it, and I have indeed acted on their behalf bona fide, then they will be deemed as having consented to it and they will be jointly uh, they will not be uh, they will not be jointly liable. They will be liable for um, the agreement, and that is learning unit five.